Would the congregation please stand? I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Very good afternoon and welcome to this service in which we give thanks to God for the life of Michael and we commend him to God. I hope you've all got a copy of the order of service and do please hold on to this after the service as one way of remembering Michael. After the service, everybody is welcome to go over to the King's Head for refreshments. There will be a retiring collection uh, jointly in aid of St Os Oswald's Hospice in uh, Gosforth and also the work of this church. And please note that in this service there will be uh, prayers of committal taking place here uh, where we're all gathered together rather than at the crematorium. So that will come later in the service. So we remain standing for these words of introduction. We meet in the name of Jesus Christ, who died and was raised to the glory of God the Father. Grace and mercy be with you. We've come here today to remember before God our brother Michael, to give thanks for his life, to commend him to God, our merciful Redeemer and Judge, to commit his body to be cremated and to comfort one another in our grief. So as we stand, let us pray. Almighty God, you judge us with infinite mercy and justice and love everything you have made. In your mercy, turn the darkness of death into the dawn of new life and the sorrow of parting into the joy of heaven through our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. We sing our first hymn. Praise my soul, the King of heaven.
please would you be seated for our prayers of penitence. As children of a loving Heavenly Father, let us ask his forgiveness, for he is gentle and full of compassion. God of mercy, we acknowledge that we are all sinners. We turn from the wrong that we have thought and said and done, and are mindful of all that we have failed to do. For the sake of Jesus, who died for us, forgive us for all that is past, and help us to live each day in the light of Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Merciful Father, hear our prayers and comfort us. Renew our trust in your Son, whom you raised from the dead. Strengthen our faith that all who have died in the love of Christ will share in his resurrection, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now a reading taken from the book Ecclesiasticus. Honour the physician, and with honour due him, according to your need of him, for the Lord created him. For healing comes from the Most High, and he will receive a gift from the King. The skill of the physician lifts up his head, and in the presence of great men he is admired. The Lord created medicines from the earth, and a sensible man will not despise them. And he gave skill to men, that he might be glorified in his marvellous works. By them he heals and takes away pain. The pharmacist makes of them a compound. His works will never be finished, and from him health is upon the face of the earth. And give the physician his place, for the Lord created him. Let him not leave you, for there is need of him. There is a time when success lies in the hands of physicians, for they too will pray to the Lord that he should grant them success in diagnosis and in healing for the sake of preserving life. Well, we have taken a bit of a liberty by including a reading in this service. It seems that Michael had been on record as saying he did not want any readings at his funeral. But that reading from the book of Ecclesiasticus, surely is too apt to be omitted. And for this man of many parts, music was a passion. Again, our hope is that today's selection of, of music and hymns enable us more richly today to honour the physician and the friend and family man. There will be a memorial service later in the year, primarily to honour Michael, the physician. But today we're here to celebrate the life of Mike, the man, and to celebrate his deep love of people, as well as cigars. <laughs> of course, the best people um, to pay tribute to Mike, the people best qualified to do it, are his family. And I therefore invite Susanna and some of the grandchildren to come forward and offer their reflections on a life well lived. We are all here today to celebrate the life of Dad. We all knew him in many different ways, be it professionally, personally, as Mike, Michael, the prof, Sir Michael, but to us, he was just dad. We would like to take this opportunity to give a little more insight into our dad. All of you who met him will know that one of dad's greatest characteristics was his ability to tell a story, some which we all heard a great number of times. 
now is when we realise how brilliant it was that he told them again and again. And we can share them now with you. Dad was born in 1941 in Shrewsbury to Evelyn Daphne and Jack Rawlins. Jack, his own father, was a clergyman. During World War II, as a member of the Royal Artillery, Jack was rescued from Dunkirk. Sadly, Jack died suddenly at the age of 32. By this point, he was father to Dad and his younger brother, Christopher. Life for Dad and Christopher must have been quite difficult and strange. Both were sent to boarding school from a very young age. Dad, only seven years old. They would spend the school holidays on the Isle of Skye with their grandparents with staff waiting on them. Over the last 20 years, Dad developed a love for Talisca whiskey, distilled in the sky, keeping in with his heritage and roots. Dad was always very interested in his ancestral past, both on his mother and father's sides of the family. He made sure to tell us all about Uncle Arthur fighting in both wars, guarding the king's coffin, and living a long and decorated life, and the Douglas Hamiltons with their Australian links. He always proudly wore his Douglas Hamilton troons that he had custom made on every possible occasion. He's even got them on today. <laughs> Growing up, Dad was a typical older brother, regularly teasing his younger sibling. One infamous time, post-war days, when bananas were a real treat, Christopher had crept down before anyone else was up. Overcome by temptation, he consumed all three bananas, but left the banana skins laid out perfectly, hoping no one would notice. Of course they did, and Christopher got into a great deal of trouble. As the older, irritating brother, Dad retold this story thousands of times, always taking great pleasure in teasing Chris for this terrible deed and the terrible trouble he got into. Dad loved retelling a story, particularly when the focal point involved embarrassing a family member. We've all been on the receiving end of those. Dad was a very talented musician from an early age. He was a chorister in his youth and won a music scholarship to Uppingham. At school, he would work hard, try to avoid most sports, particularly rugby, which he deemed a ghastly sport. He enjoyed bird watching and natural history. His greatest achievement at school was being recognized as the youngest member of the Cat Five Club. Dad was part of the RAF section at school for the CCF. During his flying test, he lost his bearings, ran out of fuel, and had to make a crash landing in a potato field. The plane was deemed a Category 5, a total write-off. He was officially awarded a tie as the youngest member of the Cat 5 Club. At around 15 years old, Dad's mum remarried the lovely Headley Boardman. Dad had a great relationship with his stepdad and highly respected him as a GP. He described him as a wonderful man who helped to always keep him focusing on the person behind the illness. The patient must always be at the forefront of your mind. Headley would regularly remind him. Dad kept that message with him throughout his career. Dad went to St Thomas's Medical School. Much to his initial disappointment, he was rejected by Cambridge University. We can imagine how much he loved telling them this, and we all know he will have done, when he was eventually awarded an honorary degree from them in 2015. Dad's mother had trained at St Thomas's as a nurse and he was incredibly proud of this. Dad forged many lifelong friendships during his time at medical school. His first two years were spent being heavily involved in the orchestra as the conductor and often composed pieces for them all to play. It was at the orchestra that Dad met Mum, where they shared their passion and talent for music. Dad worked hard and forged a career in medical research early on. Have I got the right place? Yes. Sorry. Dad worked hard and forged a career in medical research early on. One of his earliest jobs was when he was looking into temperature regulation using aspirin. Him and his colleague would regularly give themselves a fever, then test the use of aspirin on themselves. He would often use himself as a guinea pig. We have vague memories of vials of his own blood in the freezer, or him collecting spittle from us for one reason or another. It was a busy time of life because at this point, Vicky and Lucy had arrived and the family was based in London, with Dad working long hours, leaving Mum with her hands full. In 1972, Dad took on a travelling fellowship position, a temporary post which took the family to Sweden for 12 months, where I arrived. From Sweden, Dad then saw an opportunity to become a professor in Newcastle. This was a brave decision for Mum and Dad moving to the north with a nine-year-old, seven-year-old and young baby. However, it proved to be the best decision and the start of his remarkable career. Dad was aged 32, one of the youngest ever professors, where he focused on clinical pharmacology whilst working in general medicine. Dad spent 33 very happy years in this post, and even when he left, he still kept his hand in without patients. 
Newcastle University was a very special part of his life and he never lost touch. Dad was still working on some committees for the university, even up to present day. We have been overwhelmed with all the wonderful messages, tributes and obituaries. They've given us great comfort. Dad clearly achieved a huge amount in his career. He received the incredible award from Prince Mahadol in Thailand in 2013. The whole experience was unbelievable. Vicky and Lucy were fortunate to accompany Dad on this trip to receive the award. Police outriders escorted them everywhere as soon as the plane touched down in Bangkok, and Dad was treated like royalty everywhere they went, which he relished. Of course, it would be amiss to not mention the knighthoods, not just one, but two. Only three other physicians have been given the double honour of the Knight's Grand Cross, which we were very privileged to be present at. Dad experienced numerous career achievements. However, it's important to remember that Dad wasn't successful at everything. In fact, a familiar saying of his was, if at first you don't succeed, try, try, try again. This was something he used in his own practice, particularly with driving. <laughs> Dad took seven attempts to pass his test. And even then, I think we'd all agree, it was not a strength of his. <laughs> Our friend's memories of the Rawlins family car was always with the wing mirrors hanging by a thread. His mobility scooter looked exactly the same. <laughs> or the residual marks of A4 size parking stickers slapped on the windows of the car from parking at the university that he had then badly tried to scrape off, along with bumps, bangs, and a driving ban for six months. <laughs> We'd like to think that throughout our time with Dad, we kept him grounded. Dad's main concerns when we were growing up was that we would become drug addicts, end up arrested, or basically not follow protocol. He was no doubt disappointed in our academic achievements, as the three of us did not inherit his scientific mind, just his looks, large nose, and his, <laughs> and his huge ability to party. Dad was a great babysitter for Vicky and Lucy. Mum would be out playing in the orchestra and Dad would be in charge. I'd be tucked up asleep whilst the teenager slipped out the back door, unbeknown to Dad, whose head was buried in CSM papers. Our upbringing was pretty liberal, and we were trusted, rightly or wrongly, but by the time I was a teenager, my sisters had paved the way, and it was pretty easy. Dad has had many hobbies over time. All the gear, no idea, springs to mind. He was a keen photographer, even having his own dark room in the house. He took up sailing and bought Jemima Puddle Duck. Home brew kits, which Dad decided would be great to give to all the boys at Vicky's 14th birthday, who were then promptly all very sick afterwards. Dad developed a passion for politics and was a highly active and enthusiastic member of the SDP party. He would canvass for them and was heavily involved in their health policy. We even had David Owen and Shirley Williams regularly stay with us in Newcastle. With Mum, he was a very keen bridge player and he also took up golf. Dad loved skiing and would look the part in his all-in-one suits. However, his ability wasn't so strong. We'd often be left standing at the bottom of the slope for hours, watching him traversing across the mountainside for miles before he had the nerve to do the biggest snow snowplow turn and then begin the process again. Apparently, Vicky has inherited this skill. <laughs> Music was a common thread throughout Dad's life. Our parents both hoped that we would develop their passion and talent as musicians and made us learn instruments. But it didn't quite fit into our cool teenage worlds of smoking and drinking. Dad would regularly sit at the piano to relax. He even built, in his own, built his own harpsichord with his stepfather. In recent years, he even tried taking up the lute, a short relationship. Dad's favourite place in the world was Shorston, our family house up on the Northumberland coast. This is where we would fully see him relax. He took pride in his rose garden. It was possibly the only gardening we ever saw him do. He would play golf at Bamborough. Past and present sons-in-law will attest to the magic disappearing golf balls and Dad's confusion when counting his own shots. Three shots seemed to mean one to him. Dad would play snooker in the garage and even treated himself to a scale electrics when his first grandchildren proved to be females too and he could foresee a future generation with no males. Luckily, he was wrong. Dad would enjoy spending time with all the family at Shawston. All three of us were married there too, which he loved preparing for. Growing up, we would regularly meet with other families for what they called non-shoot parties. These were Newcastle family friends who weren't involved in game shooting like other local friends and all owned badly behaved Labradors like us. He enjoyed these evenings filled with music and games. For the past 20 years, Dad lived in London. He embraced London life, going to the theatres, out for dinner, and was always busy travelling the world. He seemed to need very little time to relax or sleep and would often be on the red-eye plane from New York to Heathrow, land, go straight to Charingston meeting or other. 
A lot of you will have met Dad in social situations. Dad loved socialising. You could always hear Dad before you could see him. He was the loud voice of the room, often demanding drinks. He was hugely charismatic and had the fantastic ability to get on with anyone on any level and be genuinely interested in their lives. He always welcomed our friends with open arms and enjoyed nothing more than a good argument, winding people up, playing devil's advocate on current affairs and sharing his brilliant stories. Another main weakness of Dad's was his love of Hamlet cigars. Who knows how Ken Warns and the Market Square will cope financially now without their number one customer. Our medical marvel would be in the shop daily buying a newspaper, cigars, whiskey and a bottle of 19 Crimes red wine. Dad would regularly try to give up the cigars when we were growing up, but the trail of smoke was never far behind. I believe that even Nice in its infancy was founded largely in the smoking carriage of the Newcastle to London intercity train. Dad was even allowed to have a cigar before getting in the ambulance on New Year's Day. What a legend. Of course, one bonus of having Sir Mike Rawlins as our dad was the medical help he gave us. We all reached out at numerous points with ourselves and our children for his opinion and support. I wouldn't be standing here as a mother of three without his amazing support for our IVF journey. COVID gave us two bonuses. It brought dad back north, which meant we have had three very special years with him on the doorstep, quite literally for Lucy. We've all been able to see him regularly. The other bonus was that Dad was given his medical license back, which certainly proved convenient, although I think he was probably meant to use it to help COVID patients. Up until his last days, he took great pleasure in writing various prescriptions for us all and himself. I feel like I shouldn't be saying that, but anyway, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Someone might come and arrest us. <laughs> Vicky, Lucy and I have had a very special relationship with Dad. He's always so proud of what we've achieved, even though it was nothing in comparison to his career. He's always there for us, there when we needed him. He never judged and gave us all the time in the world. He never demanded our time and would be immensely grateful for any time we spent with him. He gave us unconditional love and we will dearly miss him. We're so fortunate because on YouTube there's an interview that Dad gave in 2019. He ended the interview by saying that his children and grandchildren are the most important components in his life. He always made us feel this way. Our dad was and is our hero. His influence and belief in us has defined who we are, strong and independent, and in us his memory lives on. We love you, Dad. Night, night, sleep tight. Our grandpa was a titan. Not only did he have an incredible career where he had an immense impact on our healthcare system, both within the UK and globally, but he somehow managed to balance this with being the most caring, supporting and inspiring grandfather to all of us grandchildren. He made each of us feel so, so special. Everyone that met him would testify to his fantastic character and wicked sense of humour. On that note, we would like to share with you some fond memories of him. already mentioned but terrible driving. <laughs> One of my earliest memories is of Emily, aged about four, making grandpa stop the car, get out the car and telling him off for driving too fast around the corners. Anyone that saw one of grandpa's cars would not have been surprised by this. We thought those days were behind us but then came the mobility scooter. This is no exaggeration. Grandpa steaming down the hills of Richmond, angling corners on two wheels. As Tilly describes, genuinely scary, but really quite impressive. <laughs> he was so generous. Like the time um, he had a meeting in Paris, and so took along Lottie and Annabelle, aged about 12 and 13, to then suddenly drop them off at a metro station, stuffing 100 euros in their hands and letting them know where the meet point was later that day. They spent the entire day trying to navigate their way across Paris, not spending a dime, and instead exchanging um, the money once they got back to the, the UK. He regularly taunted Sam with bets on Chelsea's luck in the Premiership. I was never quite sure that he really knew what he was betting on, but he certainly loved to make Sam squirm. And then he balanced all this out by repeatedly sending Daisy to the shop with a £20 note for another two litres of milk, even though there was already milk in the fridge. Also, she could pocket the change. 
If anyone does know what all of this milk was for, please let us know, because we've never seen any Grandpa drink anything other than a black coffee or something a little bit stronger. But he was also there for the more important times in our life, for which we'll ev forever be thankful for. He made sure that none of us ever missed out on opportunities, and we always had the help when we most needed it. For some of us older grandchildren, um, his London pad um, became a bit of a southern home for us. When Annabelle felt homesick at university, she would hop on the train to London, kitten in tow, for some well-needed grandpa R&R. And he somehow managed to put up with Emily for the best part of the year, renting, um, squatting rent-free. As previously mentioned, Grandpa was the life and soul of every party. Grandpa had a unique balance of fun, charisma, and exceptional storytelling skills, which ensured he was never the wallflower. Whether it was a dinner party, a lecture hall, or his living room, he captivated the audience and commanded the room. We love to listen to your stories, Grandpa. These will continue to inspire and influence us. And while we may have joked from time to time about the repeat performances, what we would give to hear them all again now. He also liked creating the party. I remember the time he bought Alfie, aged four at the time, a bow tie, waistcoat, and cocktail making set to ensure we had the cutest mixologist around. <laughs> or our Christmas chocolate fountain. He drove far and wide on Christmas Day because he was so keen to get it going, only to get back for him to spike it with some whiskey, resulting in solidified brown sculpture. Having a doctor in the house had its benefits. He never failed to turn up at any hospital for all of our various incidents and emergencies and ensuring we had the best access to care. Laura and I were the first on the scene after he had a fall in which he broke his hip. And I quote, ignore the nice guidelines, they are guidelines, not tram lines, in a deliberation he was having with his doctor, much to everyone's amusement. He always had time for us. As long as I can remember, Grandpa would always also listened to us and promoted a healthy debate. He always gave our views and feelings the utmost respect and encouraged us to explore our passions and interests. He tried his very best to get one of us into medicine, and while I know he would have loved this, he never batted an eyelid when each of us eventually decided against it. Alfie, Daisy and Sam, it's now down to you three. <laughs> The following words by Sir Baba perfectly portray Grandpa's outlook and zest for life. Life is a song, sing it. Life is a game, so play it. Life is a challenge, meet it. Life is a sacrifice, offer it. Life is love, enjoy it. Grandpa, you were and will forever be our hero. It is not possible to put into words how grateful we are that you are ours and we are yours. Tonight we will burn a Hamlet cigar and cheers a famous drop of Talisker for you. You will be fiercely missed. Thank you. You all. So we're here to give thanks to God for the joyful, generous, and charismatic way that Michael embraced the gift of life. We also affirm our hope that he should safely be in a place uniquely prepared for him in God's nearer presence. As we call to mind our treasured memories of Mike, handing him over to God's good care, we reflect on Elgar's evocative composition, Nimrod. May he rest in peace and rise in glory.
Let us pray. God of mercy, Lord of life, you have made us in your, in your image to reflect your truth and light. We give you thanks for Michael, for the grace and mercy he received from you, for all that was good in his life, for the memories we treasure today. You promised eternal life to those who believe. Remember for good this, your servant, Michael, as we also remember him. Bring all who rest in Christ into the fullness of your kingdom, where sins have been forgiven and death is no more. Your mighty power brings joy out of grief and life out of death. Look in mercy on Vicky, Lucy and Susanna and Chris, and all who mourn. Give them patient faith in times of darkness. Strengthen them with the knowledge of your love. You are tender towards your children, and your mercy is over all your works. Heal the memories of hurt and failure. Give us the wisdom and grace to use aright the time that is left to us here on earth to turn to Christ and follow in his steps in the way that leads to everlasting life. God of mercy, entrusting into your hands all that you have made, and rejoicing in our communion with all your faithful people, we make our prayers through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Amen. Together we say the Lord's Prayer. So let us pray with confidence as our Saviour taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We stand to sing the hymn, The Lord's My Shepherd, based on the 23rd Psalm.
remain standing for the commendation. Let us commend Michael to the mercy of God, our maker and redeemer. God, our creator and redeemer, by your power, Christ conquered death and entered into glory. Confident of his victory and claiming his promises, we entrust Michael to your mercy in the name of Jesus our Lord, who died and is, a, and is alive and reigns with you now and forever. Amen. Some words of comfort from the Psalms. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy, slow to anger and of great goodness. As a father is tender towards his children, so is the Lord tender to those that fear him. For he knows of what we're made. He remembers that we are but dust. Our days are like the grass. We flourish like a flower of the field. When the wind goes over it, it is gone, and its place will know it no more. But the merciful goodness of the Lord endures forever and ever towards those that fear him, and his righteousness upon their children's children. We have entrusted our brother Michael to God's mercy, and now we commit his body to be cremated, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, in sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our frail bodies, that they may be conformed to his glorious body, who died, was buried, and rose again for us, to him be glory forever. Amen. Together, let us say the prayer, God be in my head. God be in my head and in my understanding. God be in my eyes and in my looking. God be in my mouth and in my speaking. God be in my heart and in my thinking. God be in my end and at my departing. Amen. Support us, O Lord, all the day long of this troublous life, until the shadows lengthen and the evening comes, the busy world is hushed, the fever of life is over, and our work is done. Then, Lord, in your mercy, grant us a safe lodging, a holy rest, and peace at the last, through Christ our Lord. Amen. May God give you his comfort and his peace, his light and his joy in this world and the next, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. After our final hymn, Jerusalem, as the um, organist plays Debussy's Claire de Lune, the coffin will be taken to the church porch and I would ask you please to remain in church for a short time as the family make their final farewells um, and when they come back from doing so, then we're free to leave the church. So let us now, as we remain standing, sing Jerusalem, a rousing end to this service. Mm -hmm. 